Dear Heavenly Father, you are the rock in which we stand. It is you or nothing, Lord, and we thank you. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us today, that your word would come forth with boldness and authority, that we would appreciate and then appropriate and apply your word to our lives, Lord. All these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. That song is so powerful. And I know that it's sort of an older song that you might have had to sing. I, every time I, th I think of that song, I think about like camp. Uh, going to camp and having to sing that song. And uh, trying to just skip through that song so you can get to the fun song. Yeah, you ever had that? Okay, we have to do the religious song and then let's get to the fun song. Okay, but... Realistically, that, that is really what is the essence of our faith, that we stand, that our faith, that our trust, that our basis, that our very essence is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's powerful. We have begun a series looking at the spiritual warfare that is ongoing in any believer's life. It may not be something that we all see. It's not something that is clearly visible all the time, but its effects are constantly in our lives. Paul would tell his young protege, Timothy, that anyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. He says, everyone. So in our series, we've begun to look at a text that is from the book of Ephesians. This was a letter that Paul, the apostle, had written to the church at Ephesus. Now, Paul knew something about this church because he helped in one of his missionary journeys to help found this church of Ephesus and had been there several times. The last time that Paul was there, it was particularly unique because his presence started a riot. <laughs> and the riot was, was so bad that they had to sort of run him out of the city. But his friends and the people who stayed there, the people who housed him, the people that were there with him, underwent significant violence and persecution. So he knew something about this church and the adversity that they faced and the problems that they were experiencing. So he writes this eloquent letter, and the, and, the, and the letter starts off with this idea of who they were in Christ. Their possessions, which included who they were in God and who they were in Jesus Christ and who they were in the Holy Spirit. And then he moves on to begin to talk about their their walk and how they should walk in purity and how they should walk in love, how they should walk in unity. He's saying this to this church that he knows is undergoing significant problems. And I like because he moves on from chapter 4 in Ephesians where he's speaking to them about walking into unity. He goes into chapter 5 where he's speaking to families about walking in harmony. And after he does all of this stuff, he gets to the point where he teaches them at the end how to walk in victory. And I share that with you because that letter to the church of Ephesus could have been written to the church at Rochester called New Hope. God knows what you're going through. God knows the adversities you've experienced. God knows the loss that you're dealing with. God knows some of the health concerns that have occurred. God knows the stresses and strain. God knows the context of our environment. God knows all of those things. And he is speaking to us today. How we walk in victory. I like how 
He sort of sums all this stuff up. He's been giving them admonition after admonition, encouragement after encouragement. And all of a sudden he gets to this thing and he says, and I'm sorry you can't see because it's right where like the moon would be. <laughs> but he says, finally. He says, you know, in light of all these other things I've told you, in light of all the good for let me get to the the most powerful point. Let me get to you to the point where you need to understand. Let me get you to the finally point. Finally, in light of all these things, finally, in light of the things you've experienced, finally, let me tell you this, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. I've underlined that idea of putting on the full armor of God. When we look at how this is written, we often read it to say, put on armor that is given by God. Amen? Most of us read it that way. When you really look at the intent of it, it's really talking about putting on the armor that is God. Putting on the armor that God already has. The armor that we are putting on in this text is the same armor that God himself wears. Now, we're, I know we're speaking metaphorically, but God himself describes himself as one who is wearing armor. And so the idea is that we are to clothe ourselves with God himself. In Romans 13, 14, he says, Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature. That idea that we're putting on God himself. In the Old Testament, they have plenty of wonderful portraits of this process that occurs. And one of my favorite is found in the book of Zechariah. And in Zechariah, we see a picture or a vision where the high priest was at that time. And, and the people of, of Israel at that time had completely messed up. They had abandoned God. They had turned their backs on God. And God had brought them back, brought them back into the land which he had promised them. But they were full of guilt. And so we get this portrait that says, Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were, wearing, who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away the sin. I have put rich garments on you. This idea that his own righteousness was replaced with a superior righteousness. It's the same thing that we're talking about today. But before I even get to that, I want you to look at what the emphasis is on. The emphasis is, is on not only whose armor it is, meaning this comes from God, the, the righteousness we're talking about today, the faithfulness that we've talked about before, the peace, that we talked about last week, all those things come from God. They are not manufactured of ourselves. We are not trying to merely be better. But this is a transformative process that comes from God himself. But it's really interesting because he pushes people in this thing to take a stand. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. I hope you understand this, that God is telling the people of, of Ephesus at this time that there's going to be all these things that are going to occur. You're in the middle of all this adversity. Uh, by the way, um, Sort of a little aside, excursus here for a second. <laughs> we tend to spiritualize adversity. We tend to sort of sanitize it, right? 
we, we, we look at, at sometimes at folks and we say, um, yes, we all have our cross to bear. And although Jesus had this big wooden thing that actually like drove nails through his hands and he bled out like a real cross, we'll say like stuff like this. And, and I know we don't mean harm by it, but it really does us disservice. We'll be like, yeah, you know, I got arthritis in my back. And that's, that's, the, that's a cross I got to bear. That's what it is. Okay? And we've sort of sanitized it and spiritualized the reality of the, 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 the degree of the adversity that they're talking about here. Okay? What he's talking about is a real issue that real people were really after them. How many people have ever seen the movie The Three Amigos? Come on. How many of you have seen The Three Amigos? Uh, you got to see The Three Amigos. It's, so in The Three Amigos, uh, th there's three comedians who um, think that they're taking a role in, in, in a Mexican film. And they go down there, and they're not really taking a role in a Mexican film. The people who hired them thought they were really were uh, heroes. And so it, it takes them a while to realize they're not in a movie. And the bad guy was this guy called El Guapo. And he was a bad... And so at the end of the thing, the, one of the stars says this, gives this big old speech, and he says, everyone has their El Guapo. He goes, to some of you, it's poor health. For some of you, it has been you know, this, that, and this. He goes, but for some of you, it's really an angry guy who wants to kill you. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying, that, that realistically, Paul wasn't talking about little stuff. He is giving this advice in the midst of some real stuff that was happening, life and death things were occurring to the people in Ephesus. And he was telling them to stand. Now, this is hard for us, okay? This, this, this is hard for us, okay? So I grew up in a denomination um, where we saw demonic presence in everything, everything. If you had a sandwich and it didn't taste good, you know who did that? The devil was all up in that sandwich, all right? And we saw it everywhere. And in those things, you would... You were taught to be aggressive, right? When you would see and taste the sandwich that wasn't good <laughs> and it had the demon in it, you were to rebuke it in the name of Jesus over that sandwich. And you were to, you know, you had to have the right language and, you know, you had to warn people who were around you. I don't know if you guys have done this. Come on. You had to warn people around you. Hey, if you're not prayed up, the demon that's in the sandwich might go right into you. So I'm giving you a warning. You can leave out of this room because I'm about to cast this thing out of this sandwich. <laughs> All right? And we're joking about it, but sometimes we have opposing, um, I, should, I should say, a, a tension in regards to how we deal with real spiritual warfare. In some ways, there's, there's, there's communities of faith that are seeking out those things, and they just want to destroy it, and it's a very combative, and we're, and we're fighting in the name of Jesus, and all that kind of stuff. And then there's other communities that just say, you know what, we're going to run. Every time we see something, they even see that, run! And you're constantly running. And some of that would say that's, that's normal, you know, fight or flight. But what God is telling us in the midst of our adversity is he wants you to stand your ground. Just stand. In the book of Exodus, we have the people of Israel who have been delivered from bondage of 400 years by these amazing signs and symbols and by the power of God's outstretched hand. And God brings them out. And we get to a key moment where in front of them lies the massive Red Sea. Behind them 
are Pharaoh's best chariots seeking to destroy them. And so when they're in that tension of not knowing what to do, the people begin to cry out to Moses, who was their leader, and say, we should have just died. We should have. Why would he bring us out here to kill us? We should have just stayed there. And Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm. Take a stand. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you to the day. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Sometimes in the midst of our own adversity, we want to fight it. We want to run. But God sometimes is just saying, I need you to be still. Let me be God. Right? Isn't that what he said to the psalmist in Psalm 46? Be still and know what? That I am God. But see, when you're running around, when you're moving, when you're scheming and stuff, you can't know that God is God because you won't let God be God. And I'm not saying this very lightly. I am sure that if I was Moses and I was in this situation... Okay, first of all, they wouldn't have heard what I had to say because I'd have been like women and children with the life preservers on. We're going to have this strategy where we're going to flank on this side, run on this side. You're going to make it the best who make it to the other side. God bless you. Let's go. (laughs) We would have been planning and scheming and and all kinds of stuff. And God would have been like, no, I got a plan. I know God, I got this. I've got this. I got a plan. Right? So sometimes God, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your fear, in the midst of your anxieties, in the midst of real pressures that are seeking to destroy your life or your relationships, in the midst of that, sometimes God is saying, I need you to stand. I need you to be still. Let me deal with this. So in the book of Ephesians, he tells us, he says, stand firm then. And he says, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. We had heard already from Isaiah 59, 17. That was read earlier. It says, talking about God, he had put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his his head. You see, these are descriptions of God. So when when Paul is talking about the armor of God, he didn't just make this analogy up. It wasn't like he said, you know what? It would be really cool if I made a really neat metaphor that had to do with like soldiers and stuff. No, he took the words already from scripture that he knew in Isaiah, and he was saying, we need you to stand firm. And how do you do this? By putting on God. Philippians 3.9, this is from the message version, talks about this idea of righteousness in our ability to stand. And I want to connect these to you so you have an understanding. He says, I don't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, which is God's righteousness. So what is he saying? He says, you know, I can try to do the right things by keeping a a bunch of rules, or I can receive from God a righteousness that's significantly better than anything I could do or imagine. So a couple things. What is righteousness? It's the quality of being in right relationships. It's a relational term. We, as Americans, we read Scripture through the lens of individuality. So when we look at righteousness, we tend to look at it as an act of conduct. Someone does something that is right or wrong. Whereas when you look at it from an Eastern worldview and you look at the roots of the words, it's really talking about being right in respect to my relationship with you or my relationship with God. Okay? Righteousness 
as we look at it biblically, is a quality of God closely tied with justice, its right character and actions that are equitable, fair, and faithful toward others. That's righteousness. When we do something that is right, it should be equitable, fair, and faithful toward others. That is righteousness. So why is he telling them to put on this word? What does that have to do with anything in terms of them standing? Well, there's two separate types of righteousness that are implied in Scripture. The first one is called imputed righteousness. And this is a righteousness granted to us uh, based solely on what God has done. God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. Those sins were in the way of our relationship with God. When we put our faith or our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, according to Scripture, we have his righteousness imputed upon us. It is placed on us. Positionally, we are made right. Our relationship with God is made right. We are in a clear relationship with God. The Bible goes further to, to describe that and says that we are children of God. That we are heirs with Christ. That we are the bride of Christ. That we are the body or the temple of God. All of those things come because of an imputed righteousness. Because of what God has done through Christ, we are now in a right relationship. Had to throw in a little bit of theology there because it's important. So hang in there with me. Some people go like, oh, theology. <laughs> All right. But the other thing that happens is not just an imputed righteousness, but an imparted righteousness. That it tells us that as we put our trust in Jesus Christ, that God sends his Holy Spirit into our lives. And literally, we have a righteousness that is granted to us by God based upon what God has done in us. Imputed what God has done for us. Imparted what God is doing in us. And because of God's work in us, we become more like God, and therefore our relationships with others become right. So this righteousness of God. And it tells us that, this, that we put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate was literally this thing that you put on that covered your heart and your chest. It was protective. And why would we need righteousness to protect our hearts? Well, here we go. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. If I want to get to you, if I want to affect you more than anything else, I attack your heart, the center of your emotions, the center of who you are. Once I affect that, everything else is easy. All right? I call these heart attacks. I'm sort of really bummed by this background. It's, it's, it's really bugging me a little bit. I, 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 on my computer, it looked way better than this. Just, anyway, just so you know. Uh, Proverbs 27, 19 says, As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects a man. Meaning that we are a manifestation of what's in our hearts. We are. So if I can affect a change or attack your heart, I am attacking who you are. Matthew 15, 19, and 20 Jesus is trying to tell them, they're saying, well, if you eat the wrong things, you're not going to be righteous. And Jesus is, is pretty much saying, you can eat whatever you want to do. Uh, and I thank him for saying that because Sticky Lips has a really good pork sandwich that I, I'm glad that I can really indulge now because he did this. Just anyway, <laughs> he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts. 
murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. The point of what he's trying to say is that it is the heart. And we have to guard the heart. And how do we guard the heart? We guard the heart through righteousness. There's a couple things about the heart that I want to talk about just very, very briefly. Um, Just bringing it to the real practical level. The reason that the heart protection is is vital, significant, is because it actually affects how you pragmatically practice the love of God to others. Okay? Really interesting study. Um done uh, probably four or five years ago, they found that if, if I take uh, Kayla and I have a complex task that I ask her to do, uh, figuring out something, let's say on a spreadsheet or something of, uh, the, of that kind of complexity, that I can put all kinds of distractions around her and they will eventually disrupt her ability to do things effectively. Okay, so let's just say she's sitting there. I can put some, some bright, bright blinking lights on there, and eventually she will have to stop focusing on the thing and address the, the blinking light. But what they found with visual stimuli is that you can teach someone to ignore that, that once she acknowledges it, she can ignore it. And you can do that with all of the stimuli of the senses, whether th- that would be a sound that is really loud or obnoxious or, or really low, or whether it's, it's something that's rubbing up, up against the skin, or even in military experiences, they've shown that people can block out pain and still be able to focus on things. People can be taught that. What he found throughout the whole experiment, though, was that the only thing that you cannot block out is emotive stimuli. You cannot block it out. If there's something that is occurring that actually invokes an emotional response. Maybe it's something that has happened. Maybe it's a trigger of something else that had that caused you pain in the past. Maybe it's something that triggers your anxious thoughts. You cannot block it out, and you cannot extinguish it through training. That's how important your emotional health is. And we have to learn how to, to, how to manage our emotions, or otherwise we can't even focus. And you've probably seen this before, or experienced that? You ever got in an argument with somebody that was an important argument and there was like stuff you were supposed to say, but you didn't say it? You know how like you have a way better argument in your head later than you did actually when you were actually having the argument? And then like you think that you've, that you've gotten past it and then something happens, maybe you're, you're working on the computer and something, you see something that reminds you of that argument and what happens? No matter what, you start having the conversation again. You start saying, no, no, what am I going to tell you? And then I said that, and then, yeah, say something else. And you're just talking to the screen. The person's not there. Why? Because it's a mode of stimuli. Until we deal with the emotional aspects of it, we cannot move on. It's how we're wired. That's why if you're having issues of a significant anxiety, a significant depression and stuff, that's not just going to go away you're going to actually have to give it some attention. It's how we're wired. And then secondly, uh, the primitive emotions, fear, anger, etc., always overrule rational thought. Always. If there's something that you have a phobia of and somebody just tells you, that's silly. And even if you know it's silly, you still can't do it. You, you, You can't. Um, back in the uh, 14th century, uh, one of the philosophers, he, did, he delved a little bit in religion, a little bit in other things, named Pascal, he was talking about that if you told a person or asked a person if they could stand in a three-foot plank um, and just stand there without falling, what would they answer? And, and he would say, the person would say, I can stand there. He says, but if you take and you, you dangle that same plank over a thousand foot drop and you ask the same person, hey, I just need you to stand there, it's the same plank. He said, a person couldn't stand there because their fear would they would fall because their emotions are overruling the idea that they, they could still just stand there. Um, 
So just, just know that. And that is why the attacks on our heart are so huge, because our emotional health drives everything else. Okay? Here's, here's the thing, and I'm bringing this all together as we close. The way that this works and the way the temptation has to do, it has to do with our righteousness and being in the right relationship with God and knowing that we're in a right relationship with God and knowing that we're in a right relationship with others. When you notice that Jesus was tempted in the desert, I like this. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returning from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit in the desert where he was for 40 days. He was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during these days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. Now look what the devil says. The devil does not challenge if he has powers or if he has authority. The devil says, if you're the son of God, if you are who you say you are, if you actually have the relationship with God that you say that you have, if that's really real, because it's pretty much not real, if you do, that's the temptation. And then he wanted him to act out from that idea, to have doubt on his own relationship with God. And that's what God is saying to you in the midst of your adversity. He wants you to know that he has put his righteousness upon you, that you are a child of God, that you are heirs with Christ. That you are the temple of the living God. So that when things occur, when things happen, when adversity comes your way, when you feel distant from God, when you feel distant from others, you will know without a benefit of the doubt that I am a child of God. God is here. God is with me. God is moving us forward. And all I need to do is stand. We are the children of God. My last metaphor, and I want to leave it here. As I share this last metaphor, I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is the story of King Jehoshaphat. I think that uh, he's one of my favorite kings of Judah just because I like saying Jehoshaphat. <laughs> but he's actually one of my favorite kings, too. And there's a point in which King Jehoshaphat, he's doing all the right things, but there ends up being this massive army of enemies that is marching upon Judah. And at that particular time, they had sort of a small army, but th so it was like a 10 to 1 type of thing. And he sits there, and he's trying to scheme and figure out all kinds of stuff to do, and this is what God says to him. He says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. And I'm going to paraphrase that. New Hope, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged because of all the things that have occurred recently. Because of the losses, because of your own stress, because of lack of job, because of all those things, because of mistakes that were made. doesn't make any Don't be afraid. He says, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. He says, you don't have to fight this battle, so, so stop trying. Take up your positions and stand firm. See the deliverance the Lord will give you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what kinds of issues and adversities that you're facing right now. All I can tell you is that God, the God of creation, the God of wonders, is here telling you, I just need you to stand. I need you to stand firm and understand that you're going to put on my righteousness that is yours when you put your trust in my son Jesus Christ. And he will remind you through the power of the Holy Spirit when you're in the midst of that adversity who you are. 
Because the world, Satan, whomever who comes against you will try to make you forget who you are. The worship team is going to lead us in a song of response. And this song is called Stand. And as you see the words and, and, uh, and just hear them, I would ask that you take the opportunity to come on up here and just stand. And we're using it as a symbol that God, we hear you. And we're going to stand. And I don't know what your situation is, but whatever that is, you give that to God and say, God, I'm going to stand. Will you do that? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your righteousness. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, help us to stand. We love you and we thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.